Hello. Today, and I confess rather earlier than I thought, I'm going to begin a series of videos on Henry VIII, the man that I've spent much of my life studying. I am, of course, going to begin at the beginning, with the day that he was born. Most of what I'll be saying is taken from my book called Henry Virtuous Prince, but I'm adding a few things and thoughts you always have thoughts, uh, even when you've researched something thoroughly, and actually new things that I've found. So, as I said, we'll begin at the beginning with his birth, and we'll go roughly up to the age of 11, when, in circumstances no one could have envisaged when he's born, his circumstances, and those of England indeed, are changed forever. Henry is a midsummer baby. He is born on the 28th of June. Actually, it's quite difficult to find the date out, very surprisingly, for a royal child. When, uh, 30, nearly 30 years later, the date of his birth becomes very material, because it was needed for the divorce proceedings against his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, they had an awful lot of trouble in establishing the precise date. And finally, they found it in the only really contemporary record which gives that date, the 28th of June. And it is the Book of Hours of Henry's grandmother, Lady Margaret Beaufort, which she left as a great heirloom, a great treasure, to her chantry at Westminster Abbey, where it would then have been chained up. And the Book of Hours, that's... that's a kind of, it's a book of daily devotions, the book of hours, and as they usually did, it began with a calendar in Latin, using the Roman calendar of saints' days. And in just the same way that later people, Protestants of course, tended to use their family Bibles to record momentous events, Lady Margaret Beaufort used this manuscript, she used this book of hours, and she inscribed in it notable events, like the triumph of her son, Bosworth, like the birth of Henry's elder brother, Prince Arthur, like the birth of his elder sister, Margaret. And for all of those dates, she gives extraordinary precision, you know, the date, not simply the date of birth, but the hour, circumstances, place, and all that kind of thing. For Henry, 28th of June, it is a bare statement of fact, a bare record. And you know what? Virtually nobody else notices it. Chroniclers don't remark on the fact. We've got absolutely no account of the ceremonies surrounding his birth. Indeed, it was legitimate to one <laughs> whether the ceremonies had actually taken place. We know he was formally baptised um, at Greenwich, at his birthplace of Greenwich, in the church of the Franciscan friars there. And we know that again, because much later on, uh, as part of those divorce proceedings, the man who'd baptised him, Richard Fox, his father's great minister, and the man who becomes Bishop of Winchester, remembered baptising Henry. But that, until recently, was the only record we actually had of the ceremony. And then, when I was researching my book, I had the great good fortune to come across the record which shows not the detail of the ceremony at all, but a very important stage of the preparations for the ceremony. The regulations governing the royal christening were set out in a, it's a kind of handbook of court ritual and procedure, which is called the Royal Book. Um, I was able separately to identify precisely what it was. It's a kind of handed down possession of the inner circle of court administrators, particularly of the gentlemen ushers, and it's written down and transmitted at moments, which was actually quite frequent, the changes of dynasty. And the royal book that we have that would have governed the ceremonies surrounding Henry's birth was the one that recorded the ceremonies of the Lancastrian court and handed them on to the Yorkist court, where again variations were noted. And the ceremonies governing a royal christening were very elaborate. Uh, the important thing was the publicity for the child. So the centrepiece of the ceremony 
obviously the christening is more or less the same for any Christian child, except that to stop royal babies behaving badly, they were christened in warmed water, so there wasn't, because by immersion, there wasn't the shock of plunging the baby uh, into cold water. Um, but the, the, the key point about the ceremony as it emerges from the royal book is the desire that it shall be visible. And to that end, the book specifies the construction of an extraordinary kind of series of circular stages in the middle of the Chapel Royal or the, as it was in the case of, Gen uh, of Greenwich, the Church of the Franciscan Friars, a series of stages on which the clergy can stand and then at the very top there's a platform uh, where the actual ceremony takes place itself and the whole thing is supported in the centre on a massive post and on top of the post in the center of that top circle is placed the great silver font of Canterbury which the practice had developed in the 15th century traditions were invented in the Middle Ages at least as frequently as they are nowadays. The silver font is brought from Christchurch, Canterbury for each royal birth and it's placed on top of this extraordinary sort of stepped circular structure uh, and the warmed water put in and the ceremony takes place. How do I know it took place for Henry's birth? Well, we actually have the account of how the bare wood and metal of this structure is concealed and made it appropriate for royal birth. It's the records of the royal wardrobe and it shows the kind of fabrics which are used to line the font to stop the baby abrading itself against the silver, to drape over the font, to shield the windows, to stop you know, nasty draughts, um, even in summer, um, affecting the royal child, the, 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 the covering of the steps with rich cloths, the, the a canopy, a fringe canopy of state, and so on. All of that we have recorded uh, for the birth of, of the Lord Henry, you didn't use the title Prince, save for the Prince of Wales, all that recorded for the birth of the Lord Henry, which actually shows that the ceremonies that we know Richard Fox officiates at take place according to the full ritual of the royal book. Well, I suppose, how could it have been otherwise with somebody like Henry, whose entire life is going to be lived on a stage and with ceremony, and on which he learns to perform so very well. But equally, the obscurity of Henry's birth does tell us something very important. He wasn't very important at that point. He's just the spare. He's not the heir. Probably not even as important as his elder sister, who would Margaret, who would of course be a highly valuable marriage prospect, and was indeed to be married to James IV, uh, the King of Scots. And it's actually from her and from that marriage that the whole modern line of the British monarchy survives, since none of his children, as we know, when he becomes king, would have children of their own. So Henry, not terribly important. The spare not the heir. But this fact, this registering of Henry's unimportance, is actually the fundamental fact about his childhood. It shapes his childhood. It governs it insofar as Henry is a product of nurture and not nature, and of his environment and not his genes. It's the fact that he is the second son that shapes him. How so? Well, I've already mentioned the birth of the elder boy, Arthur, in 1486, and in complete comparison, contrast with Henry, his birth um, at Winchester is elaborately recorded, and it's there, of course, quite deliberately, like his name, because it's intended to evoke the round table, Arthur, a new Britain that would be erected by a king, Henry VII, who had Welsh, native British blood, and so on. A tremendous ceremony. Arthur is then evoking that remote past. But remember, Henry, Henry VII, is a usurper. Usurpers are very sensitive on the subject of precedent because, of course, they've got to prove somehow they are legitimate. So when it comes to bringing up 
his own children when it comes up to bringing Arthur and eventually Henry, his sons, they're the ones who really matter. And Henry is very sensitive to the most important recently available precedents, which are the precedents of the children of Edward IV, the Edward IV of the House of York, who was, with the expulsion of Richard III into the darkness of ignominy, um, a king uh, in, in deed but not in right, as he's always known after his defeat at Bosworth. With the pushing of Richard into ignominy, uh, Edward is the last legitimate king of England. And he too had two sons, an elder son, who is called Edward, and a younger son, who is called Richard. The elder son, Edward, is of course made Prince of Wales, and the younger son, Richard, becomes Duke of York. That fact is going to be very important in Henry's life. What Henry does, what Henry VII does with his with his eldest son, is to have him made created Duke of uh, to have him created um, Prince of Wales early uh, in 1489, and by an extraordinary coincidence, when he's three, and by an extraordinary coincidence, the ceremonies surrounding Edward's. Uh, Let's get that right. By an extraordinary coincidence, the ceremony surrounding um, Arthur's creation as Prince of Wales coincide with the birth of his sister Margaret. So you have this astonishing, all taking place in Westminster, you have this astonishing double celebration of the legitimacy of the new house of Tudor and its fecundity. You've got the creation of a prince, you've got the birth of, of an elder daughter, what we would call a princess, all happening in the same day or two. Astonishing. Arthur, however, as far as we can tell, is never really brought up with his parents. He was a premature baby, and that birth at Winchester had taken place because then Winchester was somehow believed to be Camelot. And in the great hall of the castle there, there hung, as indeed there still hangs, a great round table. We know it was made by Edward III, remade by Henry VIII, repainted eventually by Henry VIII, but then devoutly believed to be that actually of Arthur. Arthur, the original King Arthur. So... Arthur's christening, Prince Arthur's christening there, was very much intended to evoke that past. Arthur, however, was premature, and when uh, the royal family begin the journey back to London, uh, the boy is dropped off at Farnham, at the uh, castle of the Bishops of Winchester there, probably because he's too sick to move, and his earlier years are spent there. And I think all the time, his father, Henry VII, as I've said, is aware of the precedent of how the last Prince of Wales, how Edward, Prince of Wales, the son of Edward IV, had been brought up. He had been brought up always away from his parents. From very early childhood, he'd been sent off to the great castle of Ludlow in the marches of Wales, which Edward rebuilds elaborately. By the way, Edward himself, uh, before he became Duke of, briefly Duke of York and then King, had been Earl of March, and holds vast lands in the Welsh marches. So uh, the young Edward, Edward Prince of Wales, is sent off to Ludlow, uh, created Prince of Wales, and as a child, heads a court and what amounts to a devolved administration for Wales and his upbringing, his education and everything takes place there. And that precedent is very firmly at the back of the mind of Henry VII. And Arthur, little Arthur therefore I think, hardly ever knows his father, hardly ever knows his mother and certainly barely knows his younger brother, Henry. What then happens to Henry? Well, the precedent with Henry is a very different one. The precedent with Henry is he's the second son. So the precedent is the younger brother of Prince Edward, uh, the son of Edward IV, the younger brother, Richard. Richard hadn't gone anywhere. Richard had stayed with his mother, the extraordinarily powerful, very beautiful uh, Elizabeth Woodville. And he'd been very much a mother's boy. He's brought up at court with his mother. And this, I think, I don't think I know. This is the this is the precedent which governs the upbringing of Henry. 
And in contrast with Henry's birth, about which, as I said, we know very little, business of his upbringing, we know quite a lot about. We didn't used to, because we've been looking in the wrong place. The basic record for the court of Henry VII are the books, the famous books of the treasurer of the chamber, those extraordinary records of the king's income and expenditure, which are totaled and countersigned and audited in extraordinary direct intervention by the king himself. But in these early days of the reign, Henry is doing something else. Henry VII is doing something else. He's consciously looking back beyond the Yorkists, beyond Richard III, beyond Edward IV, who'd used the chamber too. He's looking back to the days of the Lancastrians, from whom he claims descent, and he's trying to govern, go back to the good old days of government and use the exchequer. So the records of the payments, because this is what we have for Henry's upbringing, are in the exchequer. Very quickly, just as a little footnote, Henry VII abandons the exchequer because, surprise, surprise, it's inefficient and it's bureaucratic. And fundamentally, it is irresponsive to direct royal instructions. These are, you know, what changes? Self-regulated bureaucrats, and they regard the convenience and the functioning of the exchequer as being more important than the king's need for urgent money. And... Henry VII wisely won't put up with that. Maybe a message for our times there, as with so many others. Anyway, it's in the records of the Exchequer that I found the, uh, the details of the payments for Henry's upbringing. First, of course, is a payment for his nurse. Uh, his nurse, she is a, a lady called Anne Uxbridge, and she's paid the very, very considerable sum of £10 a year, and Henry always values her services, and she has got an honoured place at uh, the beginning of his own reign, and being, by the way, a wet nurse. Do we understand this? It doesn't mean a nurse in our sense, you know, kind of nursemaid or, or one of those smart ladies in uniform, uh, you know, with elaborately constructed perambulators who pull, pushes, or do they still push, used to push, um, the, the babies of rich children round Hyde Park. It means a wet nurse. It actually means a woman who suckles the child. This is because the women of the upper class, and I think this would have been true right through probably to the beginning of the 20th century, did not suckle their own children. There was, of course, no artificial milk, so the only form of feeding a child was by breastfeeding. And just as everything else was done for the upper classes by servants, so the boring business of feeding your kid was done by a wet nurse, and that's what Anne Uxbridge was. Um, it obviously established a significant bond between the child and the nurse. Not I think that Henry would have remembered it. The nurse is normally pensioned off when they're weaned, which was then later than now. In Henry's case, it's, I think, towards the age of three. So that's the first key servant. And then there are others, uh, again noted, paid very much less, you know, three pounds odd a year, who rejoice in the rather wonderful title of rockers. Uh, this doesn't mean that they wear leather studs and chains and have rings through their noses. It means that they've got the job of rocking the royal cradle, or rather the job of rocking the royal cradles. Because again, going back to the royal book, we know that Henry like all other royal babies, had got two cradles. There is an ordinary, everyday cradle. It's still a pretty magnificent affair, and it's got a coverlet um, uh, made out of cloth of gold and fringed in ermine, and luckily sort of spares of everything, uh, because even royal babies don't always behave well. But that's just the everyday cradle. He's also got a cradle of estate which is kept in his outer chamber. He's got two rooms, as well as auxiliary rooms, you know, for laundry and for servants to sleep in and all that kind of thing. And his cradle of estate is really, well, it's a baby throne. The thing is four foot long, it's covered in cloth of gold, it stands on carpets, um, it's surmounted by a coat of arms and a draped canopy and all the rest of it. 
And even when Henry isn't in it, even when Henry isn't in it, um, dropping my H's in my excitement, even when Henry isn't in it, that cradle would have been treated as the royal throne was in the presence chamber, which even when it was empty, gentlemen doffed their caps, ladies curtsy. So they would have done even to the empty cradle of Henry, the empty cradle of estate, and much more so when the young Henry was actually in it. So, but where was it? Well, to begin with, it's certainly at Greenwich, where, by the way, his elder sister, elder by two years, Margaret, also is. And very quickly, Henry's little household is moved in with Margaret's. Another daughter follows quite quickly. Then another daughter, and finally another son. One daughter dies, the son dies. But this forms the nucleus of a second royal nursery. The title of royal nursery, of course, had first been given to the nursery of Prince Arthur, that separate thing at Farnham. But very quickly, Arthur, as an eldest son, is required to become mature rapidly. Uh, in 1492, when his father, and we'll talk quite a lot about it, when his father goes off and invades France, Arthur, born only in 1486, he's, he's, he's barely six, is actually left as regent. You might say, well, that's just nominal. Actually, no. We know he presides over meetings of the council and he countersigns some of the activities of the governing council that's left behind when the king has gone off, when Henry VII has gone off to fight the French. <laughs> very briefly, it has to be said, and returns very quickly. But Arthur is there um, uh, in Westminster, uh, formally presiding over government. And after that, we do know he goes off in the footsteps of the man, after all, who was his uncle, uh, the late uh, uh, prince in the tower, Edward, uh, the, uh, the, the Yorkist uh, Prince of Wales. He goes off to Ludlow, as Edward had done, following the precedent of how the Prince of Wales had been brought up by the Yorkists. So he's gone off. The title of nursery is long gone, because after all, regents don't have nurseries. And the title of royal nursery is now applied to Henry's little establishment, or rather the establishment of Henry and primarily his sisters, because his brother Edmund is very short-lived. So Henry, get this, Henry is not brought up as we think Tudor boys are brought up. He is not brought up even as boys of the upper class now are brought up. There is no equivalent to sending Henry off to prep school age seven. Henry, right through to the age of 13, is essentially brought up with his sisters. In other words, he's brought up in a modern way. This, I think, forces us to ask quite a lot of questions, doesn't it? Once upon a time, the way Henry turned out, the, his behaviour to women, the, uh, the tyranny, the aggression, the forcefulness, the suspicion and whatever, was blamed on the typical Tudor pattern of upbringing, of over-masculinised, over-aggressive. But actually, Henry's upbringing wasn't like that at all. He was brought up with his sisters, with their ladies, right through, as I said, to the age of 13. If you actually look at the records of this royal nursery, it shows a predominantly female household. So Henry, far from being short of female company, maybe has it in excess. Maybe you're left wondering, are Henry's resemblances to us, to so many of us, you know, his fondness for divorce, his belief that love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, and when you stop loving whatever the church says, you actually stop being married. His general emotional incontinence, his extraordinary neediness for female company. These are, in many ways, rather modern characteristics, and the question needs to be asked. 
are they a product of this rather modern upbringing, which we now advocate as the necessary civilizing instrument, civilizing environment uh, for a boy? So there are all of those questions. So isn't it astonishing, these grubby scraps of paper that detail the wage payments to obscure wet nurses and rockers, actually take us in, directly in, to the psychology, to the roots of perhaps the most extraordinary man to have ruled England. So Henry then brought up like Richard, like his late uncle, the younger of the princes in the tower, Richard, Duke of York. And there's another very important point to be made. Uh, once Arthur has gone off to Wales, once this establishment, um, uh, 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 this, this, this royal nursery uh, is, is formalised, um, of course, Henry no longer has a nurse at this point, but the nursery needs managing. And what you have is a figure appointed, which is called the rather grand title. It conjures up visions of a kind of girls' prep school headmistress. She's actually called that. She's called the Lady Mistress of the nursery, and she's a lady called Elizabeth Denton. And she is even closer to Henry uh, than his nurse, uh, than his nurse Anne Uxbridge. And this is the striking thing. Elizabeth Denton at the same time that she's lady mistress of the nursery, is also one of Henry's mother, Elizabeth of York's, ladies-in-waiting. And this brings home, I think, a very important fact. And the fact is that Henry really is his mother's boy. He looks, after all, like a Yorkist. She's a Yorkist. He looks like a Yorkist. He inherits his grandfather, Edward IV's massive build. I mean, uh, in the 18th century, uh, Edward IV's grave, his coffin at uh, St George's Windsor, was opened and it was measured. And even after the el elapse of whatever number of hundred years it was, 400 years, um, uh, the body, the skeleton, of course, with all the shrinkage that's associated with the skeleton, the body was six foot four tall. He's huge. He's massive. And like Henry, uh, he's got enormous appetite, sexual for food and drink. He becomes grossly fat. So Henry is a Yorkist. He looks like a Yorkist. He has the same kind of rather flat face. Um, the, 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 the somewhat piggy eyes, the, the fine uh, uh, Cupid's bow lips, uh, the uh, strawberries and cream complexion, the reddish hair, all of that. He is a Yorkist. And there is this extraordinary closeness, I think, between Henry and his mother. She doesn't, of course, bring him up in the conventional way that we think of, as I said, but she's always a presence there. And when there's an emergency, she's the person, we'll talk about the emergencies, she is the person who actually looks after him, not his father. He's very much her son. She may even, and this is speculation, but there is some very good evidence for it, she may actually be the person who teaches him to write. Henry's handwriting is one of the great mysteries of English history. This huge square hand, sorry, he's right-handed, this huge square hand, unlike any other, it's instantly recognisable and very different from the hand, for example, of everybody who's known to teach him, including uh, the, the, the teachers of his youth, like John Skelton, and still more different from the highly elegant hands of his later teachers, um, humanist scholars like John Holt, or people who were associated with him, uh, like Thomas More, completely different. But, although we don't have much of his mother's handwriting, it's very similar. And it's also very similar to the much less formed, because they write more, much less frequently than Henry, to the much less formed handwritings of his sisters. So I think we can see Henry not simply being brought up by his mother's ladies with his sisters, uh, not simply being formally close to his mother, but actually much of the time being at her knee, leading, lead, learning there to read and to write. It's a rather an affecting picture, and I think it 
again, it takes us into something of Henry's neediness for women. I know this is not how he's normally seen, but, you know, if you marry six times, I think it means you actually take marriage rather seriously. Do you remember there's the wonderful Dr Johnson remark that a second marriage is the triumph of hope over experience? Well, what is a sixth marriage? So again, all of this stuff is taking us into the psychology of the future of Henry VIII and putting it into a very different and, I think, rather fresh and interesting light. So we have then these two brothers brought up in radically different ways, the elder brother off in Wales, learning by experience, by being head of a council, by being effective ruler of Wales, to say nothing of when he was a six-year-old actually acting as regent of England, we have him going off there learning in an entirely male-dominated household how to be a man, how to be a knight, how to be a king, whilst we have Henry learning, well, I'm not quite sure what, but probably having a rather nice time with his sisters, being properly instructed, and enjoying the role of second son. I've already made the comparison a lot between Henry and his equivalent uh, in the line of succession of the House of York. Those two brothers, uh, the, the, the sons, we call them the princes in the tower, the sons of Edward IV. Uh, the resemblance between the senior Edward, Prince of Wales, and Arthur, Prince of Wales, and between Richard, Duke of York, and Henry. Well, the comparison cuts much further to the whole question of the dukedom of York itself, and still more so to was Richard actually dead? As we all know, the, the, the legends, the rumours that swirl round the death or the murder of the princes in the tower by Richard, by the Duke of Norfolk, by almost anybody but Richard, uh, if you're a member of the society, <laughs> the Ricardian society, the Richard III society. All these rumours swirl, and the rumours were very strong uh, in the contemporary world, including the rumour that they weren't actually dead, that they'd been somehow smuggled out. And one person had a very great deal of interest in fomenting these rumours, and that is King Charles VIII of France. Now, I will, in the future, talk a lot about Henry VII and how he comes to the throne, which is, interestingly enough, by the sponsorship of King Charles VIII of France. Henry VII is a creature of a French invasion. No more no less. But very quickly, relations between Henry and the man who'd sponsored him, Charles VIII of France, break down. And they break down over the future of the great French duchy of Brittany and the succession to the duchy after the Duke Francis II dies, leaving only a daughter, Anne of Brittany, which raised the question of could the King of France reabsorb the duchy into the crown of France? And the English kings, of course, have an enormous interest in stopping the whole of the Channel Coast being dominated by the now overpowerful monarchy of France. So they obviously, Henry VII sponsors the independence of Brittany. This does not go down at all well with Charles VIII, and having created Henry by the use of Henry as a, as a usurper, um, uh, the reason that Charles backs Henry against Richard III is because Richard III too was intervening in France, so he had destroyed the Yorkists by a usurper. Now, of course, that Henry VII is intervening in France, Charles VIII's first thought is where can we find another usurper? Where can we find another rival to the throne of England to sponsor, perhaps to sponsor to invade, perhaps to bring down the presumptuous Henry VII who was dared to intervene in the affairs of the realm of France? Well, there are lots of people who are interested in that. The, the Yorkist cause, remember, has only died a few years ago. The, the Battle of Bosworth. It's only 1485. We're at this point, we're only in 1491. It's only six years ago there are lots of people 
who had suffered terribly. There are lots of people who believe that Henry VII was a usurper, had no claim to the throne, that the claim of the Yorkists was the right one. So Charles, with his money uh, and his agents, finds a willing audience. He finds the instrument, however, in the strangest of strange places. Who would have thought that the future of Henry and the future of England was going to be intertwined with a young man who'd been born in Tournai, um, borders of France and the Netherlands, was the sort of son of shopkeepers, and was at this point advertising fine clothing and silks for his master in, of all places, Cork, in the southwestern corner of Ireland. Ireland then is an English dominion. And this young lad was a handsome boy, intelligent, multilingual, good presence, gift of the gab, and all these kind of things. He's a male model, a male model, uh, strutting around in this stuff. And he's approached by a couple of French-funded uh, Yorkist agents who sort of sort of prod him. Come on, who are you? You know, you're not an ordinary person. Ordinary people don't go around dressed like this. Do they? You know, are you? Are you the Earl of Warwick? Are you the? Uh, are you the son um, of 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 the executed Duke of Clarence? You know, the one who died in the butt of Malmsey wine. Are you Richard the Third's bastard? No, he says. No, no, absolutely not to both. Swears great oaths, and then finally they keep on pressing him and pressing him and pressing him. And they say, Ah, we know who you are. You are Richard, Duke of York, and finally. Extraordinary story, but it does seem to be true. The male model says, OK, you keep on saying it. All right, I am. I am Richard, Duke of York. And Perkin Warbeck, at this point, transmogrifies into the pseudo-royal prince, Richard, Duke of York. And is so taken, not simply by <laughs> Bog Irish, but by the princes and the leaders and the kings and dukes and the duchesses, of Europe. He goes off to France. He is welcomed with royal honours by Charles VIII, who had created him. However, at this point, there takes place and that invasion, that very brief invasion of France that I referred to when I was describing the fact that uh, Prince Arthur becomes regent for his father at the age of only six. It's a very, very brief invasion and it ends very quickly in a peace treaty. And of course, as part of the peace, and, and by the way, the payment of a very significant pension to Henry VII so that he gets out of France and he can actually claim, well, the French call it a pension, the English call it tribute. He can he can claim that he has been paid this money in lieu of you know his kindness uh, in not conquering France and taking his title of King of France. Um, but the, the the terms of the peace treaty do of course require that Charles the Eighth stops sponsoring Perkin Warbeck, A.K.A. Richard Duke of York. Um, in fact. They specify that he should be handed over to the English. Naturally, um, Perkin, Richard, doesn't want that to happen. So he flees across the border into uh, the Low Countries, the modern Belgium, um, and he comes to a place called Mechlin, Maline, Maline in French, uh, Mechlin in Flemish. And there is the court of a very important lady, Margaret, the Dowager Duchess of Burgundy but she is Margaret of York. She was sister of Edward IV. She'd been married to the last Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold, who had been killed at the Battle of Nancy in 1477. And at this point, Margaret, a lonely, frustrated widow, discovers her purpose in life. Her purpose in life is to restore the House of York and with Perkin Warbeck, a.k.a. Richard, Duke of York, she has found her instrument and she lavishes attention on him. Uh, more surprisingly, um, her, uh, her, her son-in-law, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian, who had married 
that's his sort of son-in-law. Um, he had married Mary, who is Charles's daughter, Charles the Bowles' daughter, by his first wife. So he's, he's kind of son-in-law uh, of Margaret, who is the, the widow, the second wife. Um, he's also, uh, uh, Maximilian, is also acting as regent of the Netherlands. Mary herself, by this point, is dead for uh, Mary and his son, uh, the Archduke Philip. And so uh, Habsburg, Maximilian of Habsburg, who is also the regent, of the Netherlands, he too comes in with enthusiastic support for Richard, Duke of York, and indeed for the whole restoration of the Yorkist cause in England. And it so happens that um, uh, at this point, his son, his and Mary's son, Philip, is a on the point of, of attaining his majority, so he will actually appear as real ruler, and, 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 and Maximilian will cease to be regent on his behalf. Um, to introduce um, Philip to the, his, his subjects in the Netherlands, there are a series in 1494 of Grand Entrées. These are state entrances, they're great processions. The, the Netherlands is, is, is an area of vast towns, of, of Ghent, of Antwerp, uh, um, uh, of Bruges, and so on. And in each one of these, there's a state entry with great speeches, processions, triumphal arches, and all the rest of it, uh, illuminations and whatever, uh, for Philip. But alongside Philip appears Richard, Duke of York, as honoured as King of England king in right of England, and his titles are proclaimed, you know, son of Edward IV and uh, uh, Duke of York, um, by grace of God, uh, and of right, king of England, and, and uh, with the royal arms are mounted on buildings, especially in Antwerp and so on, uh, where, where he is lodged. And I'm afraid uh, this uh, so infuriates a couple of Englishmen that they do that very characteristic English thing, and they find a chamber plot with some disgusting contents and they fling the stinking contents over the usurped coat of arms of England and there is the most awful, well, stink in, in every sense of words. Now, what is this to do with Henry? Well, what this is to do with Henry is there is now a rival second son and a rival second son who is claiming to be what? He is claiming to be Duke of York. So what does Henry VII have to do? Whatever his intentions have been, he's got to make Henry, this is 1494, uh, the lad is only just over three, he's got to make him Duke of York as well. And this again takes one into the whole business of ceremony, titles and so on. Very complex, very interesting business. Uh, dukedoms in England weren't all that old. Uh, they're only invented a couple of hundred years earlier, um, actually not quite 200 years earlier, they're only invented uh, in the th from about 1350 by Edward III for his many sons, um, beginning with his own eldest son, the person that we call the Black Prince. So dukedoms are created then. And the dukedom that he creates for his second son his second son, that Edward III creates for his second son, is the Dukedom of Clarence. And that was the title which had always been used from that point onwards when kings, which wasn't very often, had second sons. Henry VII doesn't do that. He ignores that distant precedent and instead, in just the same way that he'd brought up his sons in the same way as the princes of the tower, he gives his second son the same title as the youngest of those princes, Richard Duke of York. He follows the precedent, the recent precedent of Edward IV, not the much older, actually much better, much better founded precedent of Edward III. So he creates Henry, Duke of York. And Henry, whereas his christening has been this very modest affair, Henry's creation of Duke of York in November uh, of, of 1494 is one of the great ceremonies of the early Tudor period. And several things stand out about it. The first is the astonishing performance of the boy, by the way, it's very well documented, as I said, 
chroniclers don't mention his birth, do they mention uh, his creation of Prince of Wales? The one thing that uh, his, his creation, get this right, his creation of Duke of York. And the thing that really strikes the London chronicler isn't the magnificence, though he goes on quite a lot about the magnificence of the ceremony. It is Henry's astonishing confidence on the eve of the ceremony. He too makes an entry from Eltham, I suppose, where he's basically brought up, into the city of London. And he rides alone. This is a boy barely over the age of three. He rides alone on a great horse, you know, one of these huge war horses. So the young Henry, you know, he's always going to be an outstanding horseman, but effectively, I think, he's learned to ride before he can walk. He's acquired that extraordinary knightly skill. So the thing that strikes people. The first stage of the ceremony, once you've got the entree out of the way, we now move from the city, we now actually move to Westminster, to the old Palace of Westminster, centering round the Great Hall and St Stephen's Chapel and whatever, which still the Great Hall survives completely. The foundations, the crypt uh, of St Stephen's survives as well, though surrounded by the Victorian Barry Building that we call the Houses of Parliament, then it is also the seat of Parliament and the most important of the ceremonies uh, of, of uh, the creation of the young Duke of York will actually take place in the Parliament chamber, in the chamber where the House of Lords meets. But it's also, th at this point, the principal residence of the King during the winter months when, as now, government largely takes place. So the ceremony is now shift, beginning of November, All Saints Day, they actually shift to Westminster. And the first of the ceremonies is Henry's creation as a Knight of the Bath. Again, he rides to it um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, across New Palace Yard. And then there is this, with along with all his fellow knights, there is this extraordinary business. They are stripped, they're placed in baths, which are sort of wooden things, filled, I imagine, with lukewarm water, but draped in cloth or whatever. And if he lies in the bath, this is a symbolic cleansing. The king, beginning with him, dips his hand in the water and forms a sign of the cross on his right shoulder and pronounces the words of the creation of knighthood, you know, that he's got to be good to widows, orphans and, and protect virgins and all the rest of it. All of that, this this very elaborate sign of knighthood, and then goes on to Henry's fellow knights. He's only three odd, three, three and a few months. I think he remembers. It's so extraordinary. I have memories from that age, and they were much less extraordinary than that. I think he remembers. I think that sense of the burning in of knighthood, just with the whole business of the horse, that confidence of public performance, you know, boy, just the three riding on this great thing. So there's then the ceremony of the, uh, of, of the bathing, and then there's a vigil three-year-old boy put into kind of pseudo-hermit's robe, and you keep a vigil... Um, uh, in 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 the chapel in, in St Stephen's Chapel, um, and and then you are you know, formally put to bed and all the rest of it in this this extraordinary. Can you imagine what it must have been like that winter's night with the guttering candles, the the robes, the procession, and then the next day is the actual formal creation, the investiture of the duke. Uh, duke was a always a quasi royal title right through really um, until I think the seventeenth century. So he's invested with a coronet, he's invested with sword, with 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 a with a rod, with a with 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 a golden rod by his father. And the striking thing at this point is, because he's not riding, he's actually carried. He's carried by the Earl of Shrewsbury and um, and when the creation takes place, um his father finishing it all off, um his father picks him up and he puts the lad on the table. I've often wondered, is it just his father being practical, so everybody could see him with a kind of gesture of affection. Anyway, he's now created Duke of York. So we've got two Dukes of York, two Dukes of York, tongue twister, we've got two Dukes of York. We've got Richard, probably the false Duke of York, Henry, the Tudor Duke of York. And it will be 
as it would be so often in Henry's life, a war to the death with a pretender.